uh, see all of you that turned out to be quite uh, somewhat wintry weather these days. Uh, but uh, great to see you, and it's it's going to be an evening uh, well worth uh, coming out in the, the winter weather for. So, <clears throat> let me ask a question. How many of you have ever shopped at Whole Foods Market? Quite a few. How many have shopped at Whole Foods Market in the last uh, 90 days? Quite a few. So I think it's pretty safe to assume that we're all pretty aware of the high level of commitment that Whole Foods Market makes to their customers. That's but what we may not be aware of is they make that same high level of commitment to all of their stakeholders. Not just their customers who are interested in buying the best natural and organic food products, but to their employees, to their suppliers, and to their investors. Whole Foods has figured out a business model that serves all of those stakeholders in, in almost an equal way. In, in fact, you'll hear that if they take good care of their team members, as it calls, they will work in partnership with the suppliers and the money will flow. Investors will be well taken care of. So, uh, is a, a part of an indication of the success they're having with that business model, they have been recognized uh, for 16 years in a row. And by Forbes magazine is one of the best places in the country to work. The top 100 of the best places in the country to work. And that's every year that that award has been given out. But also, they've been recognized uh, as one of the top 100 best corporate citizens because of all the things they do in those communities uh, within which they operate. We can even hear how they do that. And then how well does it serve the investors? Well, based on what I found on the uh, internet, they're up about 300% in net profits and in uh, earnings over the last four years. That's pretty good. So, it's a it's a business model that they call conscious capitalism, and they're talking about it uh, in a variety of different ways. And here's a book that just came out, written by Walter Rob's co-CEO. Uh, it's called Conscious Capitalism. It tells the whole story. It, it's a great book. But our speaker tonight, Walter Rob, has been key in developing that culture of corporate consciousness for uh, many years. In fact, going back to 1991, I think I saw it when he joined the company. And uh, was elevated to Chief Operating Officer in 2001, became co-president in 2004, and in 2010 became co CEO with John Mackey. So it's an incredible story. Uh, Walter and his team have been talking with our students here today and is going to share with you tonight how they created that culture and how they sustained it. So help me welcome to the podium, Walter Rob. Thank you for being here with you. 
talk a little bit about Whole Foods. We're going to have some fun tonight. And uh, I wanted to start by kind of acknowledging the fact that you got a great mascot. And uh, how do you say this? At, at the Bears? Da Bears. <laughs> da Bears? <laughs> you should have not been taken, or they took it from you, probably. <laughs> Anyways, I uh, uh, just want to acknowledge your history. I did a little research. You started in 1890 as a teacher's teacher school, and you were called the Northeast. We call it a normal school, right? Which I guess that makes you super normal now, right? Or something like that, as you have a normal school. But, uh, it's pretty cool tradition that you have here, and I also think you were recognized at the, uh, the the only business school ever to get this award from the office of the president. The only, as far as I could tell, the only one ever got it. And, and from what I can tell, you continue to receive these accolades because your students continue to place in the top 10 the last 10 years, which is pretty remarkable. For business school, so congratulations on what you've accomplished, and and uh, uh, I love your mission. Um, I love mission, anyways. I love mission because it really is about why does a, why does an organization exist? And that is the most important question, at least it is for us at Whole Foods. And this is your mission, and I like it. And I like the idea that's rooted in your past as a, as a education. You're all about education. But I particularly like this idea. Two things I like about your mission is one is not just about the students, but to include friends. In the community in your mission. You sort of already embrace this idea of a, you have a broader responsibility than just the students that are here. Certainly the students are at the center of it. But I also like that it's you're setting out to inspire, inspire the kids with the education, have a big inspiring experience. And the reason I like that is because, oh, by the way, you do that with a lot of uh, class in your jazz thing, right? That's pretty cool, the jazz festival. I got it from You didn't tell me about that, Kim. I like that. <laughs> So, uh, anyways, uh, well, actually, the, the reason I, I want to go back, I guess I off the slide on the reason inspire actually comes from the Latin to breathe life into. Um, and what's cool about that is that, and also if you look at education from the Latin, it's probably to lead down to what's great about inspiring is that you are actually the sort of idea that education breathes life into you, but then you have to receive that life and do something with it. It's not a passive thing. The school. See, your, your job as a school is to create an environment where you can learn, but then you have to take that learning and do something with it to create a path forward for yourself. And I really like that because Whole Foods, in many ways, shares a similar philosophy to you. Uh, we call it empowerment. We try to create a company where there's room and space for team members to do and use their imagination and their creativity. And you'll hear a little bit about that later tonight directly from them. So we share that approach to education and learning which is about inspiring rather than dictating, right? Inspiring, opening rather than trying to, try to cram something into somebody. That never really works because it's really about lighting each individual's fire, however that happens. So um, I just, it brought me back thinking about this to teaching because since your roots are in teaching, my own experience, I went to a little school called Stanford, they, they go by a duck cardinal down there at Stanford. But I had some great professors some fantastic professors and an undergraduate student. And one of them was David Kennedy on the right, he was my history professor, and, and, and Jerry Irish on the left was my religious studies professor. And these were folks that the teachers were so inspiring that you just loved that, you know, wanting to take the ideas and, and go. And, and uh, so I hope that you are having that experience with your professors here and that you're acknowledging. It's a calling, it's a dedication that these professors have to do this with you as kids. And, and you know, it's the, the potential for that relationship, particularly at a smaller school, I think is, is really rich. Um, the question that Jerry Irish gave to our senior class, or our religious studies class, was on ethics. And the class, the final exam was a take home exam. And it was a single question on the top of the sheet of paper that said, uh, drawing on all the things that we've read this quarter, uh, who are you and what or who do you find guidance for the conduct of your life? And that was the final exam. Pretty hard to cheat on that one, right? <laughs> so, but it was a great experience, and, and I, I think you guys are at the time of your life with this education. You have an incredible opportunity to just read in the inspiration that is learning, and with these relationships with your professors, and uh, particularly a school that values that so highly. So, all right, for me, I got to share this to you. This is my the guy that really uh, helped me to uh, really inspire my life, which is Dr. Albert Schweitzer. Some of you may or may not heard of him. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1960. He was at 30 years old, he went, he scrapped everything he'd done, went back to medical school and spent the rest of his life operating in a hospital in Africa. But what I share that with you here is because of the quote he talks about being young men. Can you all see the slides okay from back there? 
about idealism and reminding you that particularly at this point in your life, those of you that are students, uh, the, the things that you feel inside yourself, you need to trust them. They're real. That's, that's the uh, gas that's going to run your life, that the idealism, the ideas that you have about how the world can be different or change, that stuff is real. You've got to pay attention to it. That's what you've got to uh, give voice to it. And uh, Schweitzer reminds us of that. So uh, there's that quote that I and so here, I want to say thank you. There was about eight or ten students. Can you all stand up, those of you that helped me? Um, with, with Phil and Amber and Justin and Britton. No, I was going to say Britney Spears. No. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, you guys were really helpful. Um, thank you very much for helping me with the question. What you said you wanted me to talk about tonight, which is uh, this, was, this came from the students' directly. And I will get it in a minute. Um, these are the questions. What's conscious capitalism? Um, uh, how is it relevant to our team members? And, and uh, how do we create standards? And uh, what's it like to be on the management team? I can tell you that last one already. It's great. So um, <laughs> that's an easy one. But um, it is, we're entering a very interesting time. When the events of yesterday were horrible, horrific, right? And so it's just another reminder that there's really no way to take anything for granted in life. And uh, particularly in business right now, uh, you've got uh, a lot of political uncertainty, a lot of economic uncertainty. For many of you coming out of school, the job market's a little unsteady. You've got a lot of social questions out there. You've got 50 million Americans on food stamps now. Um, you've got a lot of these sort of big questions up on the table of how we're going to shape our civil society going forward. Our, uh, you have our customers are changing. You have a company in Whole Foods that was started by baby boomers like Will and myself, and you have it being run by Gen Xers. Um, and you have it being going to be led ultimately by millennials, who are all of you. So you actually have a company, you have a company that has three generations, and our customers, uh, we, we realize that by 2020, almost a third of our business will be done by millennials. So we're, we're literally experiencing a shift in our customers, and uh, the shift in technology is also real. I don't have to tell you probably that uh, this is just kind of uh, depicts the, the amount of time it's taken to adopt technologies, and the pace of technology, technological change right now is phenomenal. Uh, you can see how much quicker. Even if you talk to the folks at Google and Facebook right now, they'll tell you they don't even know what the next technology thing is going to look like. Look at Pinterest and some of those that have come up, Instagram. They've just shown up out of nowhere, and they're, and they're, they're being adopted so very quickly. So you're, you're coming into a world with great change. And, um, so taking a step back, this was Whole Foods started in 1980 in Austin, Texas. Uh, this is our first store um, at the corner of 10th, Lamar, or 10th Lamar in Austin, Texas, and that's what we looked like at the beginning. It's hard to believe that the company, as you know it now, started in this little building. Uh, John Mack and two others founded the company, and uh, this is where we started. And uh, there's the cars to prove it, right? <laughs> just to give you my own street cred, this is me. I started in 1977 with a small store, and you can just see uh, that's, uh, that's kind of when the natural food thing got started. I just wanted to know I was actually around at that time too. And, um, and this is what we look like today. This is our flagship store in Austin, Texas. It's now 80,000 square feet. And those are our offices up above. And the company now has grown into, as you can see, we've grown into operating in three countries, 40 states. And we have 78,000 team members in the company now after just some 32 years. It has been a remarkable journey, to say the least, and not one that we ever planned or predicted. There's no way we would have known uh, that we could have gotten to this point. And uh, I'm going to let you know a little secret, which is that we're just kind of making it up as we go along. That's really the truth. Isn't that right? well, we don't really know. So uh, uh, we never have been at this point in business uh, before. I didn't go to business school. We didn't go to business school. We didn't go to business school. We have really learned as we've grown. And, and that includes being a public company which we became in 1992 and, and doing all the things with Wall Street and just kind of learn as we went. So uh, there's something about that for you. In Colorado, uh, these are our stats now. We have 19 stores. Um, we've been in Colorado since what time? What year? Our store is... Uh, what year was that? 13 years. 13 years. So we've been in Colorado 13 years. And uh, you can see we have a DC, we have stores, and uh, we have some nice expansion plans. We're, uh, Will lives in, in Boulder. We have our, our regional office in Boulder. Tim lives in Fort Collins. We have a uh, uh, you know quite a good number of team members that are in Colorado, and, and uh, we're here to stay. And, and uh, we have some pretty exciting plans. The most recent store that we opened in Colorado was in Basalt, so at the base of Aspen. And uh, there's the map which shows you kind of where we are in Colorado. 
And uh, let me just play a little video now. And these are some of the these are some of the newest stores. And you can see we have a tradition. We don't do we do a bread breaking when we open the store. The slide's a little small for you in the back. We get everybody together and we actually literally break bread to open the store. So kind of a nice atmosphere. Let me play you a little clip from the opening. It's up on YouTube now. But this is one we made when we opened the store in the saw. So you should come up and see what comes on. Is a venue within our store in New York, and we went out and took the um, 
uh, the, some of the food sewers providers at the, at the public market in Brooklyn, and we give them 60 days in our store, and they, they run their restaurant for 60 days, and then we bring the next one in. And this particular vendor is sold out, for, their dinners are sold out for 60 days. It's a great way of collaborating with your, with your supplier partners and bringing the customer a different set of experience. This was a great idea. One of the regions in Florida created a kids' cooking camp in the summer, and this was incredibly successful. And I was actually just suggesting today that we might do that here in the Rocky Mountain because the kids loved it, teach them how to cook, and uh, it's kind of a cool idea. In Brooklyn, in our new store, we're opening the third and third. We are putting a uh, greenhouse on top of the store, 25,000 square foot greenhouse. And uh, this is the first one we've done on the scale. We grow the produce, we do some of the downstairs wall, we'll so. We're partnering with another company to do this, but it's kind of a neat idea right on top of the store. Uh, we encourage our team members to come up with product ideas and we label as such and let our customers know the team members made the product. And I love this one just because it was at Easter and somebody made a cake out of the turkey sort of shape. And the reason I put it, it's, yeah, it's a cute idea, but it's also because I want you to know that our team members have the encouragement to come up with their own ideas to do things. And that's uh, part of understanding Whole Foods culture is understanding that there's freedom and creativity allow for your team members and this is kind of a manifestation of that. So we keep raising the bar. Uh, we are all about the quality standards. I think what sets us apart in the marketplace is our quality standards. We have the highest quality standards in the supermarket industry. It's not even close and the greatest degree of transparency. You can go up on our website. These standards have been created over the years we've existed and we continue to evolve them and they're, they're species specific, department specific, and I would really encourage you, if you haven't ever looked at the standards, to go see them because uh, they are the highest in the food industry. And um, on to conscious capitalism, I want to just uh, talk a little bit about that, but I think I'm going to do this first. The secret, uh, the business model for Whole Foods is this. It is um, that we put the, the, the reason the company exists, this is the heart of conscious capitalism right now that I'm going to talk to you about. So the question is to what is conscious capitalism? It's a different way of thinking about business. Okay, bottom line, it's a different way of thinking about business and how business shows up. And this is our business model, simply put. It is, at the center, the reason the company exists, the purpose of the company. The deepest level of this whole foods company is, is to bring uh, healthier foods to the world. That's why we exist as a company. And I would also argue to create a workplace based on love and respect. And that's why you get up in the morning. You don't get up in the morning to make money. You get up in the morning to create a change in the world. And around that purpose are all of our stakeholders, all of our groups of interest that have, have an interest in the success of the company. That is our customers, our team members, our suppliers, one of whom you're going to meet later tonight, our investors, the environment, and the communities that we serve. These are the stakeholders. They have a stake in the success of the business. And you build your business from the core, from the center out, uh, around uh, understanding and, and working with the needs of your various stakeholders. And the heart of conscious capitalism is finding win-win combinations with your stakeholders to create the success of the business. Now, uh, this uh, purpose of the company, which I said to bring healthier foods to the world, it turns out this continues to evolve for Whole Foods over time. And we now have a bigger idea of what's possible for our company. And you can see in this diagram here, I hope you can see it. But essentially, we're taking on poverty in the developing world. We're taking on the agricultural system as a whole. We're taking on spreading this idea about business, one of the reasons I'm here with you tonight. And these are some of the, uh, uh, these are some of the deeper, larger purposes of Whole Foods Market as we continue to grow 32 years on. And the power of purpose, which is at the heart of our business model and the heart of conscious capitalism, is, is, is shared here by Bill George, who is a, was a former CEO of Medtronic and now teaches at Harvard Business School. Essentially saying that, in particularly in retail, anything you do can be copied. Right? In today's age, if somebody can do a display, people can take a picture, it's on the internet, but somebody's got the idea. What they cannot copy is your folks, your people, and a culture. Uh, that becomes a, a, a differentiated advantage uh, over time. And particularly when your people believe in what the company exists for, that deeper purpose of the company. That becomes a sustainable competitive advantage. And uh, that's really the idea here. And so for Whole Foods, the culture is really alive. It's like yogurt. And I thought I would show you it's just like yogurt because it's a living, breathing thing. The culture, uh, if I go back here to the slide of the four tenets of conscious capitalism, we talked about the purpose, the why the company exists. We talked about the stakeholder uh, philosophy, that is to say, identifying the stakeholders in your 
with other particular businesses and working to satisfy their needs. Not just thinking about the shareholder. In fact, the shareholder stakeholder is not even the first one. The other ones are far more important. The, state, the shareholder gets satisfied by doing the working with your other stakeholders and, and working with their needs. And we talked about conscious, we're going to talk about conscious culture. The fourth one is uh, conscious leadership. You cannot evolve a company consciously if your leaders do not also evolve. So these are the four basic tenets of conscious capitalism. John's book is a great, a great read for you if you're interested in going deeper into this. But let's go back to the culture, which for me, uh, in some ways, is almost the most important of the four. You know, faith, love, what is that verse in the Bible? Faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. So you have these four, the greatest of these is culture. Why? Because culture is the petri dish where it all happens. Culture is the mission and the values practiced over time. It's how we do it around here. It's where people connect. It's where the people live in the culture. It's the living, breathing heart of the company. That's what culture is. And you find now, if you study the landscape, that companies that have strong cultures outperform those that do not. Companies that have strong cultures will outperform over the long term as well. So um, this is a, I brought a Colorado yogurt for you to kind of make the point. You guys know this yogurt? This is a, a great company. We have, don't we have something to do? You've all seen it? Emily, has everybody seen this yogurt? Everybody knows it, right? Okay. So um, you get my point about culture. Because when you open a store, you, hear, you saw the video, you want to put that culture in the new story. And you do that by taking your team members, like the two you're going to hear from, show up there and the culture gets passed along. It's a living, breathing thing. It has to be has to be nurtured, and um, you know I've learned that I've been 30 some odd years as a retailer, and I've learned in going through the stores that uh, the most important thing I can do is just connect and talk with team members, appreciate them, acknowledge them, listen to their stories, ask. I'm, I'm genuinely interested in what's happening for them, what's their experience, and how we can continue to make the company in such a way that supports them having those experiences. So. Um, I want you to listen to this guy here. This is a team member in New York City, so he's got a little New York City attitude. But you get a sense from this of the whole police culture, so let's roll this. We don't want to have fun with natural and personality standards. We're not robots in other companies. They train you to be exactly alike. Here, we take advantage and we show how individual everybody is. We all show customers that we're people as well. We are customers ourselves, so we have to treat them as we treat ourselves. Our standards are for us. We're the ones who make whole foods. Whole foods. We make it whole. You never work in a company that's whole foods. Everywhere you work at, it's basically, you have to do this, you have to do that in a certain way. Whole foods tells you what you have to do, but they also tell you how you can do it. Express yourself, be yourself. That's why I shout. That's why I'm as loud as I can. And sweep my seafood, 100 best companies work for. There's a reason behind that. Uh, this is probably about a year and a half ago where I had a situation with my wife. She, she's been pretty sick. And Tim Gates and Mike Jay had approached me and had asked me to take some time off, you know, to spend time with my family. And I was like, I don't have enough time off. I need to kind of work. And they actually donated their time hours for me to take off to spend with my family. And that just shows you how much that, that this company cares for their employees, team member happiness. Um, it just makes you hungry for this, this company and just shows you everything what Whole Foods is all about. Just not just not that high quality um, customer service, everything. And I plan to not go anywhere with Whole Foods. I plan to grow with this company. And I definitely inspire anybody that 
to look into Whole Foods if they ever want to plan to grow with Whole Foods. It's definitely one of the best companies to grow with. Uh, you got great leaders, you got Tim Gates, you got Will Paradise. Uh, this is the first time I've ever met Walter Robb, and it's amazing. This has been the best day I've ever had for a while to meet three of the big people in Whole Foods, and I'm honored, and I'm honored to talk to you guys in front of this amazing crowd. So thank you guys so much for giving us the time, and definitely come and visit us in the Fort Collins store. That store is an amazing store. Um, all the team members that are getting along, and we would be happy to you know, serve you guys. And we go above me on. Thank you very much. My name is Ashlyn. I've been at Whole Foods for two and a half years now. I am most proud to be a team member at Whole Foods because of what it does for its communities. Um, we were talking about this earlier today in the store. A lot of communities raise money, or a lot of companies raise money for their community. And they make commercials about it, and they throw it in your face, and they say, I'm doing this. And Whole Foods has always gone above and beyond for their communities, and they don't need to do that. They don't need to tell people. They just continue to do it because they know it's the right thing. So as a team member, I'm not a tool to better them in the eyes of the community. They allow me to use the store to be a tool to help out those around me. I get to be a part of not only raising $120,000 of the food for people in need last holiday season, but I get to package that food. I get to take it to those people. I get to be a part of it. And I think that's what's most important is that I get to utilize them and they allow me to use my innovations to better those around me. And that's why I appreciate working at Whole Foods. Thanks, Ashley. So these guys will be around Ashley and Raj. If you want to talk to them afterwards, please do come talk to them. And, uh, we don't have any secrets at Whole Foods, and, uh, and so it would be great if you just come talk to them, and if there's something you don't believe I'm saying, then please come talk to them about it and get a different perspective. How are we doing so far? You guys are awfully quiet out there. Can you hear me okay? Can you see me okay? Can you see the slides? It's okay? All right. Keep going, then. All right. Make a sound every once in a while. Okay. Um, so one of the things about culture that's really important is, and in, in, we talked about the four tenets of conscious capitalism, the purpose, stakeholder philosophy, conscious leadership, and conscious culture. And about culture is we've learned as we've gotten to be older that you cannot take it for granted. You have to, and so what we're doing now is we're, we're consciously investing in our culture. Um, and we're doing that in the form of this thing called the Academy of Conscious Leadership, which we are, which we have just created. And every one of our store team leaders is gonna go through this over this next year. We've already done four, maybe three of these already. We created this, we're spending the money, and we're investing you know, over a million dollars in this academy because we want to make sure the next generation of leaders is leading from values. And to do that, you know, that's again, I, I want to make sure that every store team that is running a facility for Whole Foods is, is, is thinking about these values and leading in that way with the team members. To do that, you have to make investments in the culture. Um, so, these are our four values, and uh, they're, they're another part of the, the very part of Whole Foods. And uh, if you go into our stores, any store, and ask our team members, do they know the core values? You're going to find out, for the most part, that they do. They may not know them all, but they'll know many of them. And uh, that's a sure sign right there, I think, that you could use when you go into any store and ask, do you know your company's core values? What are core values? Um, they are things that you believe. They are things that you use to guide your decision making, whether it's for the company or in your own life. I'm sure all of you have things that are essential to how you feel about your life. Companies have the same thing. Uh, whether they declare them, whether they share them, whether they live by them, that's another question. The core values and how you make decisions as a company, that's a lot how the team members judge whether you are walking your talk, whether you are who you say you are. So let's take a look at that. Uh, these are our core values. Uh, the first two being uh, we sell the highest quality natural and organic foods and we also uh, satisfy the line of customers. How do we do that? We try to bring good values to our customer. Um, here's, you know, this is a, the one-day sales and the three-day sales and the different pricing that we do to try to bring. We just had, if you missed it last Friday, we had the fresh halibut at 12 a pound. Fresh Alaska halibut, that was a heck of a price, and, and we sold it. We sold it out. No pun intended, a bobo of it, right? So, uh, we sell local product. We, uh, and we, we have a, a lot of local product, particularly here in Colorado. At the Rocky Mountain region, we have a local loan program. We, we've set aside $10 million to loan to our producers. And the uh, Rocky, Rocky Mountain has been the most active with this program in terms of loaning. Uh, the typical loans are sort of $75,000, 5% interest. 
And uh, this has been really effective in terms of supporting producers and supporting local producers and trying to represent them at the store. There's a couple more of the local products. We continue on holding these up real fast. Uh, that, uh, uh, they were kind of good. You already know about the yogurt, and, but just quickly, Tim, tell them about the crisp store. They may not know this. They may not know this. Which one? The crisp. Just need a crisp, yeah. So these are. Is this one? So these need a crisp crackers. I actually found these at the farmer's market in Fort Collins. And they're made by a local uh, caterer. And when he made them, he was actually using a bromated flour. And they're great crackers. So I actually talked with him and convinced him to change the flour that he was using to use a non-bromated flour that we would bring it into the store. At that time, he was selling these crackers at a couple of the different markets in town, more like little cheese shops, uh, specialty shops. We brought him into the store and immediately became the number one selling vendor, or his number one account. From there, his business started to grow, and as he was growing his business, he was running into growing pains as well. And um, we actually had done a lot of work in the Fort Collins community and worked with Foothills Gateway, which hires a lot of special needs people in the community. So I put him in contact actually with the, my contact at Foothills Gateway and actually hired special needs people to come and package his crackers for them. We then took him from the Fort Collins store and started bringing them on one of our trucks down to the Boulder store. And from there, we now have them. We're selling them in all the different stores in the region. He started out with three people, and he now has 33 people. The last time I talked to him, he had 33 employees. So it's a great story about a great cracker that not only is a local product, but also is giving jobs back in the community. Fantastic. Who has not tried the native crisps? It's yours. Uh, you share. You share with your pro there. <laughs> so um, we also offer exclusive products. Obviously, at this point, we're a larger company. We're buying products from all over the world. Uh, we create standards. These are our secret standards. One of the questions you asked is how do we create these standards? It's very hard for you to see this slide uh, in, on this slide. I just want to make the point. It takes time. You take little decisions, and you keep making little decisions, and uh, you build your standard over time through through work and through it. The more that you come to know, you take the next step. And the result of that is that we have now every piece of seafood in Whole Foods is fully transparent as to its sustainability. We have a first in the nation sort of system when you go to the case that lets customers know how that, and we stop selling any fish that is not sustainably fished. It's red rated. We don't sell it anymore. We stopped in Earth Day this last year. Same thing in meat. We pride ourselves on selling this as a, some folks from uh, Harvard, Colorado meat. We try to highlight the fact that it's local meat and who's producing the meat for you. Compare that to what happened with the horse meat in England recently. And the fact that most hamburger in this country comes from uh, six or seven different countries and it's put together. We try to tell you who produces it, where's the producer, and where is it produced. And our standards, again, uh, there's how it shows up. We have a five-step standard that is fully transparent on how the animals are treated. It's all up on the website for you. Again, this standard was built over time, little steps at a time, and making this decision together with our suppliers in dialogue to create these standards to bring our customers a situation where we can say not all hands are created equal. But how it shows up at the store for you is like this, the five-step process along the bottom of the case, 100% transparent uh, against this standard built over time. And uh, I'll skip that one. Um, how we monitor our suppliers, again, it's a little bit of, a little bit of a eye chart where you see the slide at the back, but um, essentially, if you take a, a longer view relationship with your suppliers, and we, we start by having a quality standard just a common vocabulary with our suppliers. That builds trust, that builds partnership, and we monitor against those uh, standards together, and uh, been very successful in being able to do that. Okay, whole trade is our standard we buy uh, from 80 countries around the world now. We have a standard called whole trade, which we've created, which has got a social and environmental and financial part to it to support the flowers, the vegetables we buy from developing countries. It's a premium to the producer. Uh, and this is where it looks like in the Colorado store right now, Fort Collins with pineapple. I have been, I speak Spanish, I've been in Ecuador, I've seen them pack the flowers, I can speak to the ladies, I can tell you that the premium that they receive, if you all knew the pesticides and the child labor that goes into growing flowers around the world, you would think you would think twice about, about that. And this whole trade flower gives uh, them a premium. Uh, they are very much appreciate the investment that this purchase of this goes into their communities. Uh, and it does represent our partnership with our communities, not only in the United States, but around the world. 
This is our copper mine Allegro, which is based in Colorado, roasted in Fort Colorado, and it's 100% of the coffee is, is uh, whole trade. So our core value is team member happiness and excellence. Everyone hopefully is on a team. This gets into your question about what does the culture mean to the team members? What does conscious capitalism mean to the team members? You've heard a little bit already from the RAS, Ashton, what it means to them. But everyone hopefully is on a team, including myself, we're all the team. And uh, it's interesting that the business schools are now realizing that happy team members is actually a good way to do business. Like the, like the light bulb went on, that if you treat your folks well, uh, it's going to be, it's going to result in good morale, it's going to result in good business, but that's where we are, and, and that's how we do the whole foods. People, human beings like to belong. They like to be part of something. And uh, all of us at Whole Foods continue to discover the magic of being part of a team. Um, this is a dream wall. I love this, because one of our store team leaders in New York City created the dream wall upstairs where team members could put the dream that they had for themselves. I love the fact that we're a place where that can happen in the first place. But this fortune that we try to satisfy one of those dreams each and every month. One was somebody who sent it all to one of the tractors to send home uh, to his other family and those sorts of things. And just the fact that you're able to talk about people's dreams in the workplace is very cool. Our turnover is less than 10% against the industry average in the supermarkets of 100%. This is our actual turnover numbers last year for Whole Foods. It's about a tenth of the supermarket industry. Uh, and almost 40% of our team members have an equity interest in the company, either through an option or a share. That's pretty unparalleled in the uh, corporate landscape in America. Maybe Starbucks is another company that's close to that. But so when we talk about team members being actual owners, the culture they actually they actually really are owners. Um, and this is just a little bit about leadership and the difference between we don't have managers and whole foods, we have leaders. And uh, the difference is about this inspired thing we talked about at the start, where a leader tries to inspire and encourage uh, others, a manager tries to tell them what to do. We try to do the leadership thing. And you simply cannot evolve your organization if the leaders don't evolve. If the leaders don't let go, the leaders will not make space for other people to grow and succeed. So core values around team member happiness and excellence, and we have hope benefits. You can see that we provide those to our team members and 87% of our team members pay ten dollars less per month for the benefits, and we uh, also vote on it collectively. Last time, almost seventy thousand team members in the country voted on a ballot to collectively select the benefits that we offer each other. Pretty unusual for a company our size. We offer health immersions for team members. We can go for six or seven days. We pay for them to go. These are set up with doctors and obviously healthy uh, diet approach. And the team members are losing 60, 70, 80 pounds. And they write letters to us, to John and myself, saying how much they appreciate the experience. And they can't believe that a company would invest in their health like that. You don't think, after they come back from immersion, that they're feeling good about the company and being there. Uh, you don't think it represents the healthy eating core value in action. It does. It represents the company doing what we say we're going to do with our values. Uh, these are the four pillars of our healthy eating. Uh, we think ultimately that the way out of this healthcare crisis is people to take more self-responsibility for their eating. Ultimately, there's a $3 trillion spend going on in America right now in healthcare. 80% of that is lifestyle diseases. It's 100% preventable by diet. But it does come down to personal choice and responsibility. That's the way out. That would leave plenty of money left for all the things where uh, they need to take care of the safety net that needs to be there. But folks have to step up. There's no other, there's no magic pill here for this. It's just more folks learning how to cook and take responsibility for the diet. So, uh, and we're not holy foods, we're just whole foods, but we all we do have a point of view about healthy eating. So we win relationships with our suppliers. Here's the principles. We think uh, we, we we do we do think about the win-win. I talked about the stakeholder philosophy. It's very important to think about suppliers as partners, not somebody taking advantage of either way. And uh, once you hear now from one of our actually I'm gonna uh, this is a, you're going to hear from Harry in just a minute, who's farming with his family right here in the south. I mean, those were in the south, like 5.6 miles. I mean. So, uh, actually, Harry, why don't you come up and then we'll, we'll play this while you're talking and you can share a little bit about your experience. Okay, we're moving along. Harry? Yeah. Come on. And I'll run your footage while you're talking. So, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. My name is Harry Strohauer, and, and like Walter said, we uh, live about five miles south of here in the south. And uh, we have a family farm in there. My wife, Katie, and son, Tad, are here. And Tanya, director of sales for us, are sitting in the back here. But uh, we grow uh, potatoes, onions, corn, we cure various vegetables. Um, We've been privileged to be a supplier for Whole Foods now for about seven years. Just come talk about the physical hospital. Okay. Yeah. 
And uh, we've really enjoyed the relationship uh, with Whole Foods. Um, uh, it, it's been a win-win, hopefully both ways. We've uh, had many of the team members from the from the Denver, D.C. and different stores out to our place and and uh, showed them around. And likewise, we've been up to the D.C. many times or, or to the stores. And uh, I've really enjoyed going to the different produce departments and, and visiting with them. And, uh, like I said, it's just been a great relationship, and uh, um, we feel good about what we're doing. We feel good about what Whole Foods does. Um, people that I talk to that uh, have never shopped at Whole Foods ask me about them, and, and the way I relate it is most people when they go to the grocery store say, I have to go to the grocery store. i got to go shopping. And a person that goes into Whole Foods typically says, I get to go shopping. I get to go to Whole Foods. <laughs> it's an experience. They enjoy it. They, they like to, many people like to eat there. They, it's just a good experience. But uh, we, uh, we appreciate uh, what they've done, and uh, we're sure privileged to work with them. Thank you very much. Again, I hope you'll come talk to Harry afterwards about his farming. This is a, a real farming right here at Five Miles from the campus. If you haven't been down to see uh, a great farming operation, and I haven't yet either, I have to do the same thing, but it would be a great opportunity to make sure the students can go together and Harry, you guys would have them out there, right? So, yeah. Okay, some pretty good footage, right? Shot that with his iPhone, I think, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I think in the interest of time, right, we're probably running a little tight on time. How are we doing, Jim? We're doing okay. <laughs> what does that mean? We're doing okay. What? We're running okay. I won't show you uh, Jim from Hazel Day. Thank you, Jim. Good <laughs> <laughs> news and environment. This is our wonderful core value, and I, I just want to say this is, uh, you know, we make, uh, we recycle our cooking oil in certain parts of the country into fuel. Uh, we, uh, we make our own compost. We actually have a compost facility in season, and where, where is it in uh, Colorado? It's, it's, it's Eastern Colorado. Eastern Colorado, somewhere that we haven't been, but oh, we actually beyond take Platteville. Oh, beyond Platteville. So we, we chuck out our vegetable waste out there and make compost, and it comes back in the form of the uh, bag. We have uh, solar energy, we have wind energy, we have 100% offset of our electricity use, so we're making progress there. I've been a US, US EPA green power partner for a long time. and. Uh, we also, this is a, an example of where we bring our suppliers and put them into our parking lots uh, a couple of times a year to let the customers actually experience. So it's it's actually kind of a depressant on business in some ways, but it's great for the supplier. So in the stakeholder philosophy, you have multiple stakeholders winning. That's a good win. That's a win-win for the company overall. And uh, we've created a couple of wonderful foundations. Well, Kids Foundation is now two years old. It, uh, we do. We have put over 1,500 salad bars in school districts, over 1,000 gardens, and now we're working on healthy eating education for teachers. And Whole Kids Foundation, you can see all that online. And, uh, our, and our newest core value is really around uh, uh, the, the reinforcing this around the communities. And this is from and this is one of the bars from Whole Planet Foundation. She makes uh, batik in Senegal. Uh, Whole Planet Foundation is uh, now seven or eight years old. We are uh, essentially uh, through your donations at the register and through the activities. A third of our team members voluntarily give money to Paycheck, the Whole Planet Foundation, which essentially is working uh, microfinance loans in the developing world, average loan about $150, mostly to women, a hand up, and they use them to start business. And uh, the results of this foundation are nothing short of unbelievable success over seven years. We're now loaning in some 60 countries. We have over 100 team members go on volunteer trips for a month work in these countries and work directly with some of these borrowers and it's just amazing to think when somebody steps up to the register at the store that they're somehow through that purchase connecting all the way across the world to some other country or somebody in need and, and through the power of business helping them to improve their life. And our latest foundation which is just starting up called Cool Cities which has the purpose of serving underserved communities in this country. This is a shot of our new store in Detroit which opens on June 5th. It's a bit of a step out there for Whole Foods because there are no supermarkets in Detroit. And this is a 90 percent African American community, and uh, the life expectancy within the uh, city limits is 12 years less, less in Detroit than it is outside the city limits. And some of that certainly has to do with a lack of access to fresh, healthy food. Now, most of the food in Detroit is sold in convenience stores or corner stores or party stores. 
and uh, this is our effort to try to take a step in the direction and to create a foundation to try to support uh, better health outcomes. Um, so finally, we created Wall Street Profits and Growth. I'm going to finish up here quickly, which is to say this is a chart of the Fortune's best companies to work for, their financial performance, stock performance against the S&P. You can see that, again, the point earlier, companies that practice, uh, I would say, conscious capitalism, whatever they call it, are outperforming on a financial basis. This is us celebrating 20 years as a public company in NASDAQ and hold good style, which is that we do it together. We do it as a team. We come here together tonight. We do everything together. We do it equally as a team. And that's how we celebrated 20 years as a public company uh, that day in New York City in Times Square. It was really cold. Uh, you, know was really, you know what was really cool, though, was the team member of the year was a maintenance worker for one of the stores in New Jersey. And I asked him if they would put his picture up on the town in, 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 Times, in the square there. And they did. And for, for a minute, Samuel Johnson had his photo hanging up there on that big thing. And we took pictures of it. And you don't think that guy went back and was flying on his broom around his throat. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, was, you know, it was just one of those great moments that happens where when you uh, realize the power of sharing things with people, uh, it's, uh, it, it was just a magic moment for me to see his uh, happiness. Um, again, kind of bringing back this to kind of the close is, I think the message here is that capitalism as it has been practiced, uh, this is from the CEO of Unilever, who's done some great work over the last couple of years if you want to study it, a large company that's changing their practices. Talks about capitalism as we know it having reached its sell by date, which is to say that now you're going to have consumers who are, have a lot more of a say about how companies operate. I made a case to the class earlier today that if you're not thinking about these sorts of broader sets of responsibilities as a company, you're going to be at a competitive disadvantage in the years ahead because customers are going to insist, and your team members are going to insist that your company behave this way. So Howard Schultz says it another way, which is to say it's not about profit, it's much more about responsibility and partnership. You have a lot of significant business leaders saying the time has come to think differently about business. And so many business behave, so many business people behave badly. You've seen this KPMG thing that just happened in the last couple of weeks where you actually have a cover of the Wall Street Journal. You have a you have a you have a partner, a major big eight or big six accounting firm, walking with a lot of cash in a used car lot and giving it to somebody else. Where is the ethical compass here? This is the stuff that gives business a very bad name, when in fact business is the greatest value creator, uh, in, in my opinion, in society. And capitalism is the greatest economic system ever created to improve life. And But it has to find a higher ground. It has to find a moral compass. It has to find an ethical basis. It has to find a wider set of responsibilities in its practice. And if you go back to the ancient times, the uh, this is a picture of the Agora from a thesis in Turkey where it was last summer. In ancient times, the business community was at the very core of the community. When you came into the town, all roads led you right into the, to the Agora, which is the thing. And that's my view of business. The business should be at the very center of civil society, creating value, creating jobs, creating a greater benefit for all. And um, so in closing, really about conscious capitalism, it just comes back to the sort of idea of people that um, the opportunity here, as you all think about going into business career, and I hope you will, um, is that you think about these wider sets of responsibilities and you realize that ultimately the, uh, the opportunity in the 21st century is to create a company around people that empowers people, that believes in people, that leaves room for their creativity, their intelligence, their abilities. The central idea about Whole Foods I would leave you with is this that we believe, or we strive to believe, we strive to create a company that supports and encourages and empowers individuals each and every day. And I think that's the opportunity to create a business in the 21st century. So with that, I will say, I um, hope I've answered your questions. Thanks for having us to greet it. And we'll stay as long as you want to answer questions. And you have Barry, and you have our team members, Will and Tim. And thanks a lot for having us. Appreciate it. Where mission leads, lead, you know, where the 
the greater good of the, of the company leads the, uh, the shareholder. Right? We have 350 stores at this point. We're, they're almost $13 billion. We can afford to take this step and experiment and risk some capital. Uh, to do this store, we had to craft an, a, an economic model that was a little less expensive, right? So the rent is lower than we pay St. Paul Palms. And that was because we're in an enterprise zone and we work with the developer to craft a business model that's less, so the break even is lower. Nonetheless, we're risking $12 million in capital. We're, we're signing a 25 year lease. We're creating 80 jobs. We're, we're, we're putting ourselves at risk. Most importantly, our reputation. When we did the press conference for the announcing the store with the mayor, the first question I got afterwards was, well, what happens when it fails? I mean, they were already going to the sort of thing that you're going to leave, right? I said, look, look me in the eyes. We are going to stay. We're going to do this. We're not leaving because that's a city that's experienced a lot of companies coming and going. So I guess, A, we're at a point where we can, we can take the risk. B, I think the risk is, is moderated by the size of the company. And, and, uh, and I think, too, we've designed the model so that our, our break even is lower than, say, it is in other parts. And, uh, and four, the reward of the, of the two years of building the store, which opens to do good, and the learning to the company as a whole, the, the, just in the cultural sense itself, of learning how to rethink your assumptions about selling healthy food, or what that means to people, is to beyond rich. And we have, an, and I say uh, about Detroit is that, uh, and besides the fact that I think we have a, I'm really bothered by the fact that fresh healthy food is available for some people and not for all people. When I know what a difference it can make in people's health and the quality of their life, and I feel a moral, a moral obligation to do something about it. We have a skill set to do it. We should try to do something about it. So um, I don't know how it's going to turn out. I don't know what the volume is going to look like. Um, I do know that we built community over the last two years, and um, I'm encouraged by what I see. Um, and we'll have to see kind of how, how it turns out. But uh, it's it's one of those cases where. Well, your mission, your mission, your purpose, you let that lead you. You let that lead you. And, uh, and you trust where it's going to take you. That's, that's where we are with Detroit. We're, we're currently in conversations with uh, Mayor Long in Chicago for the South Side of Chicago and Mayor Cory Booker in Newark. You know, those will be the next two cities that we'll do as well. So it's an important step for, for Hope Woods, I think. So, thanks for the question. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I want to preface this by saying I'm a huge fan of John Mackey because he stood up and said, you know, Obamacare is whack. So I was a huge fan of that uh, ever since he appeared on Stossel. But you might be a minority on that. Oh, I'm not even a happy being a minority. I think it. Um, you guys will get, you and John will get along just, just fine. <laughs> <laughs> but my question is, is how does that controversial statement affect your company as a whole? Yeah, fair question. Um, you know, remember, leaders are also individuals and have individual opinions, and uh, so um, I think John realizes on that particular one, when I had dinner, I, had, I was with him that afternoon and that evening, I think he realized that that was a poor choice of words, and that he, were, you know, he would have said it differently. He doesn't believe in, in, uh, in uh, socialized you know, uh, medicine and where, where he thinks it's going, but that's not what he thinks. And by the way, if you look at Whole Foods track record on the healthcare for our team members, it's pretty good. So our own track record is pretty darn good. But, how does it affect the company? Will you want to answer that? You want me to? Yes, sir. I, you know, um, can you hear me? Or do I need that microphone with the IRD cord? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so one of the things we do is uh, we go around and we do these what we call town hall meetings or team member connection meetings, and we go and we talk with folks. We do them two times a year in, in the stores, and we talk with our team members. And we say, you know, if you want to find out or get the pulse of the store, ask the people who do the work. And so it's great. So uh, we were in Utah last week, and uh, this question came up in a couple of meetings. You know, this idea of like, well, I bet you guys cringe when you know John speaks up. You know, I bet everybody cringes. And it's like, well, if you look at the 33-year history, 32, whatever it is, 33-year history, I think there's three, I don't know, three or four incidents in 33 years where he's spoken up and. Um, you know, people react to it. So I think his track record is pretty good. And, you know, John, that's the John is, and he's just, you know, he's a leader, he speaks his mind. And so what what happens? Well, um, some customers tell you they're never gonna shop with you again. And then, you know, 10 days go by and you see them, you see them in the store. Um, and, then, um, and then we get other folks that come in and say, you know, I've never shopped in your store before, but I really, I really like what your CEO says. 
uh, what he has to say on healthcare. And so I'm in here shopping. You know, um, there was a Wall Street Journal article, Wall Street Journal article a few years ago where he first did the piece on Obamacare, right? That first one, and then there was the recent uh, comment on uh, where he used the word fascism, right? So those are the two most recent ones on healthcare. But, but um, probably not the best word. But. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, but look, I, I think people realize, like, he is an individual, and you want to work for an individual. You want to work with someone who has strong opinions. I think John's track record of creating jobs, I think John's track record of uh, supporting people has been great. And, and he also feels like, hey, I'm a citizen of this country, and, you know, I can speak my, I should be able to speak my opinion in the same way that he encourages every one of our team members to use their voice as well. So. I don't think it has that big negative impact. You do hear from some folks, and you know, I think the biggest the biggest concern that we have on some of it is when it puts the team members on the front line That's it. who have to answer those questions. You know, on the, on the cash register as the folks come in, and they repeatedly over an eight-hour shift have to answer this question. And keep in mind, most of the folks didn't actually hear it, so they just said, well, you know, your CEO called the president a fascist. You know, that's what it turns into. It's like, well, that's not really the truth. So, you know, we feel for that. But, you know, we put talking points out for folks, and we try to make sure that, you know, they know, here's really what was said, and, you know, um, you know, form your own opinion on that. But in terms of the impact to the, to the overall business, you know, in, 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 in the country, I would say it's, I would say it's really, it's really extremely minimal. I agree. So... Let me, let, me, let, me, let me ask you unequivocal about this. We love and, and we love John. I mean, we, he's one of the greatest entrepreneurs in the, in the history of the century. He's right in the same class with Steve Jobs. And I knew Steve Jobs. He's that good. He's that strong. He's that powerful. He's got that much of a vision. He's an incredible, incredible guy. But not only as a friend, but also as a business person. So uh, we, are, we are so fortunate to have our founder uh, still in the company as he is. So uh, yes, there's, like any person, he's not, you don't get the nail with John. You get all the flavors, but, uh, but that's who he is, and uh, we're really, really fortunate to have him in the world today. So, good question, thank you. Hey, by the way, I was just thinking in, the, in our secret little bag of tricks here, we do have another uh, product, right, Tim? This is from this is from the healthy eating department right here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Jim, what happened about these things? Did, what was the one? Uh, what they they were just voted in, in Fort Collins as the best. City. Best of <laughs> <laughs> like these? Would you like these? You like them. Okay. As <laughs> big as you are, I guess. What else? Is there another question? Yes, sir. We've all watched uh, Walmart with uh, philosophy and its style of culture of business be the cheapest, the low, uh, low, uh, low cost, discount, low service. All those things, <laughs> and over a period of time, they've swallowed up a lot of other businesses. Uh, I know it's nice to say we want to get good food, but sometimes, particularly on a low budget, which a lot of people are now, they have a real advantage. How do you compete with that? Well, um, you know, we're competing with them just fine. I mean, their, their comps are sort of 1%, our, our comps, which is year over year sales, is about 7%. So we're, we're, you know, we're arguably gaining market share on them, not the other way around. But I don't know if you guys realize that uh, two things about Walmart. Number one, about one out of the four food dollars in the United States goes through Walmart. And even 10 years ago, they were not even in the grocery business. And now they're by far the largest grocer in the United States, like almost 170, 180 million dollars worth of uh, food they sell. You know, seven hundred billion dollar market. So they're powerful in the, in the food marketplace. Uh, number two is they have a noble mission, which you alluded to, which is to sell food for less and, and uh, make it affordable, folks. You know, in, in that you get into these uh, these trade offs about the quality of food. Uh, you get into this controversy about they don't do they health care for the team members. It gets externalized to the community to pay for that. These sorts of questions, which are beyond what we can talk about right now. So. Does that matter to people when you, you know, I don't know, but we recognize we're not all things for all, we're, we're not trying to be all things for all people. Our mission as a company is to bring quality food to the marketplace. We are going to continue to do it and make it as affordable as we can and hold true to our quality standards. We don't have preservatives, additives, colorants, these sorts of things. And so uh, uh, that being said, we're, you know, our 365 line, which is pretty strong, is, is it can be with anybody. If you check it out, the quality is there and the price point is also there. So um, I think we're fortunate to have the, the amount of choices that we do have in today's marketplace, and uh, people have to make their respective choices about where they want to shop. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. 
Well, no, no, keep going. Well, back, back then, I was a poor retired associate dean here. And I, here. Yeah. And I taught a class, but I had one full class for the on ethical issues at Walmart. And it's not the employee, but the business practice. And uh, I'm always amazed to watch them grow and grow and grow and grow. And be, be successful, pay their shareholders. Well, you know, they've stumbled in the last few years. I mean, the last five years until this recently, their stock was basically flat. It did nothing. Right. Then they got caught up in this sort of situation in Mexico, which reflected poorly on them. They have not succeeded in many countries overseas. And in fact, in the United States, they're not growing year over year in the same way that they used to. So, um, but there's no inevitability to their success. But they do, uh, they have had an effect on the marketplace of, you know, bringing the prices down. Now you have many other players in the market doing similar things. Costco is also an example of a very successful company with low prices that has a different set of values, right? I am bigger. Oh, well, Jim City, all the former CEOs, a friend of mine, is uh, one of the best business leaders I've ever met. And he's retired now, but he's a fantastic guy. So uh, there you have it. Yeah. This, this question about price and quality is, uh, is we, we, we could talk about it for an hour or so. Some more value comes in here. Right. Well, price value, it's, it's never about price, it's about value. Too. <coughs> Maybe one or two more questions. Uh, you would have one here, and then yeah. yeah. Uh, my girlfriend shops, and I have many friends who shop at Whole Foods on a regular basis. And frankly, they swear by it. They just buy anything. And I've eaten numerous other products there, and they they are high quality. And the pricing, I believe, is comparable. One of my biggest concerns has always been the overusage of plastics in order to package your products, uh, particularly those items that come from the deli or the bakeries. And I've always wondered that a corporation um, that prides itself on this environmental side, and I wholeheartedly praise uh, what you're doing for other people around the world, buying your, your company yeah. beans directly from them, that is spot on and something all corporations should, be, should have in, in their mission model. Right. Um, is there any potential for Whole Foods to move away from this excessive use of, well, a lot of them are not recyclables in that sense there. I mean, my philosophy with recyclables is that if you don't use them, there's nothing to recycle. And one of the biggest problems that we have around the world right now is pollution of waterways and air through an overconsumption of uh, petroleum byproducts. So yeah. I see Whole Foods as being a contributor to this, and um, it heavily balances in my desire to purchase from your store because I don't want to go in and buy a safety bun it comes in a plastic item like that. I want to go in and buy a CD button that I can buy a piece of plastic paper. Yeah. Well, okay. You, you can want, do that. You can do that. You can do that. You can do that. You can do that. Back to the ironing board again. Yeah. <laughs> We are doing so much with respect to the environment that we wouldn't have time to cover right now. If I could tell you what we've done with our, our packaging standards for our private label and with manufacturers, I think if you do the research, you'll find Whole Foods is a leader in, uh, in continuing to raise the standards on recyclables. But, but to your point about the plastic, and, and, and the interesting thing on the uh, on the salad bar containers, for example, no one has yet done a, a non-GMO uh, uh, polymer that allows us to do that package. We could do the, that, but then we'd be supporting something that we don't want to support with respect to the corn. So we have a little bit of a pickle there until somebody figures it out. But um, we're going to have to talk about it. You know, bottom line, what we're trying to do right now is to make sure that people can get the product from the store to their house without it leaking all in their car and being a problem. And we also want to be able to present, like we start wrapping the sandwiches in banana leaves. <laughs> people want to buy them. And, you know, seriously, they go to India and it's like all the stuff that's coming in banana leaves and you're getting, you know, all your chai comes in these little cool little um, clay cups and then you just throw it on the ground when you're done and it goes back into the earth. And so we're looking at that sort of stuff. We're, we're talking about like, okay, can we get an autoclave in our department, working with the healthcare, um, with the health um, department in each town, can we get an autoclave or something in there where these um, containers could be reused and people could bring them back? Because you have the health department concerns as well in terms of what you're packaging it in. And so, I mean, we, this is something, this is a really big topic for our team members, you know, real concern. You know, we have a green mission team in every single store. We have regional green mission representation and company green uh, mission representation. And it's a concern of ours is now. But what we know for our customers is they want to see what they're buying. And, um, and you know, 
lot of those sandwiches we can wrap in paper, a lot of the things that you uh, buy out of the pastry case, you can actually put them in a piece of uh, just uh, paper, wax paper, and we have the bags that you can put them in with no plastic. So there are alternatives on that, and um, it's just tough. Like some customers will bring a container in and say they want to reuse it, and you look at the container and it's like, you know, there's spiders in this thing. And it's like, you know, when they get, when they get sick, it's not because not because of their container, right? It's because of you. So we are looking at this stuff all the time. We're in agreement. We have a, a team that works on this thing on a global level, and you will see us continue to make strides in this. But right now, like what we hear from folks is like, we want to see it, and we want to make sure we get it home in one piece. So we are looking at it. If you'll give me your name and address, I'll send you the report that the company does that shows you all of our activities with respect to the environment. You might be, might be, might make you feel better about the things that we are doing. Well, my concern was I actually had an experience at the Fort Collins store and went in to buy something from a pastry shop and I went to stick it in this oversized piece of cold plastic and I said, can you just... Can you guys take that back to the store and talk to the bakery about that? Foil, make sure that people know you have that option. And um, they said, this is all we have to leave the store. Well, that's not good then. And that was my concern. Good feedback and we'll work on it. Yeah. Okay. Well, Otherwise, no, I think Fort Collins does a lot of great things. Okay, we'll work on that feedback right away. And it starts on that and starts on that right <laughs> Having been in the trash industry for many years, I would be curious to see what comes out of your dumpster. Just like a lifestyle audit, but hopefully there will never be any plastic in there for, from you. I digress. Anyway, um, you can do it, I digress. I acknowledge my hypocrisy. <laughs> Um, the therapy thing. <laughs> you do a great job of making sure that the foods that you bring in from overseas are safe. But yeah. I'm curious about your solar panels. Yeah. Did you buy those from an American company or Chinese? Yeah, actually, what we do is we uh, there are two. We partner with a couple of American companies that make them. That actually we don't actually own them. They put them on, and, and we have a joint financial sharing arrangement where they. Uh, we get the tax credit, the tax credits, and, and uh, we get the reduced utility bills. We're not we're not really that concerned about who owns them. We're more concerned about a doing the renewable energy because you know we, we cannot run a grocery store on solar panels. There's not enough. And, you know, we have some stores that have solar panels on the whole roof. And My understanding is made in China. If that's I don't mean. know. I don't know who made our panels. There we have. Uh, we have, I think we have nine solar stores now, and I'd have to get back. If you want to give me your name, I'll research that and get back to you. Just I don't know the answer to that question. You know, the amount of environmental damage that China does every year, yeah. today, if you're buying product other than... I don't know that we are, and I don't know that we're not. I just don't know. But it's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. So one more. We have one, one more. One, one, one more question. One more. So I'm kind of back to member here. I hope it's a good one, because you've got the last question. <laughs> They say that about faculty people, don't they? <laughs> so I, I teach you resource management, and your your success is amazing to me. And I'm just curious, what kinds of um, successes did you have to convince others to follow your model? I just had a you know a typical conversation this afternoon with an HR person who basically described to me their culture was employees are disposable. Um, dispensable and we'll get the next person to sign up and, and do our thing. And so I, I just find it amazing as to why more companies don't buy into the real understanding that it is the employees that bring the value to the organization. You know, that's why we're doing things like this. We want to talk about it and share. I mean, I want you to see our team members how great they are and I don't know what else we can do other than to walk our walk and be true to ourselves in the marketplace and try to do these things where we come out and, and share with you because you know, you're not going to change anybody's mind unless, unless they, you know, they have some experience that's different, right? So, you know, first of all, we don't call it HR. We call it team member services because a human is not a resource. Coal is a resource. A human is resourceful. Right? I mean, it's vocabulary matters. And we're talking like it's some sort of component or something like that. And, um, so I, you know, I don't know. I don't know the answer to your question. All I would say is I think more companies are realizing that the people are what makes a company go, and, uh, and the power of being able to do that. So um, I'm hoping that you know, John's book is selling very well. He talks a lot about that in there, and so you got the book, and we do some talks, and we come out, and 
Uh, I think it's hard to spread the message. This is, a, this, is a, this is the way to do business in the 21st century if you want to be successful. Not only because you think it's the right thing to do, but because if you want to be successful, you're going to be competing against companies that are treating the people right. And you're going to lose. Ultimately, you're going to lose. So, um, Are you finding it easier to have other executives do a 180 on their value proposition or just their philosophy on how they manage their team? Some are and some aren't. And we do a conscious capitalism conference twice a year. Just had it in San Francisco a couple weekends ago. I'm amazed that the companies are starting to show up now at these conferences, and there were 700 people at this one. And uh, so people are coming little bit by little bit, and uh, you know it's getting talked about. And so I think I do think it's it's starting to tip a little bit in terms of this way of thinking about. It. There's a lot of a lot of CEOs that are out there talking about these sorts of ideas. So I think it's a time it's it's, it's an idea that's time has come, and, um, and I think it is the idea of the, of the 21st century for business. I really do. I really do. So. Okay, there we are. Thank you. Walter. To, to wrap up, I don't have any question of you. I have a request of you. Because I've heard you comment that Whole Foods is looking at expanding from 400 stores to 1,000 stores. That's correct. And as you're looking at communities for expansion across the country and across the globe, uh, I would ask you to remember your friends in Greece. <laughs> we would love to have a whole food store here in Greece. But we want to thank you, Walter and Will and, Will and Tim and all of the team for probably here to share your, your ideas with us. Uh, you've given us a lot to contemplate, and we're just so appreciative. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Right, Jim, on the way home.